Hey, hey, and welcome to episode number 73 of the Brave Widow Show. Well, if you are hearing this podcast on the day that it's published or very shortly after, you still have time to join us for the Widow Winter Solstice on December 21st from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Central Time. It's almost Christmas time at the time that I'm recording this and at the time that you'll hear it. And I would love for you to join me at the winter solstice event. We have activities, we have music, we have free giveaways. We have a panel of widows who are ready to answer some of your toughest questions and some of the biggest challenges that I see people struggling with. So there'll be available to answer those for you. And we would love to have you join us. It's a hundred percent free to join. And the way that you can sign up is by going to bravewidow.com slash winter. All right. In today's episode, I talk with Aaron Belding about his story. So without further ado, let's jump in and hear from Aaron. Hey, hey, welcome back to another episode of the Brave Widow Show. Today, I have a special guest with me, Aaron. And Aaron has had some unique challenges in his uh, grief journey with him and his family. And I cannot wait for you to hear his story and some of the words that I know he has to share with you. So Aaron, thank you so much for coming on the show today and welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, I know our audience would love to know a bit about you, your background, and really your story. So uh, if you don't mind, I would love for you to share that with them. Absolutely. So uh, today happens to be the five-month mark uh, since my wife tragically passed suddenly um, from a brain aneurysm. There was no warning. We met just shy of about 14 years prior. Um, Due to different circumstances uh, in our lives, uh, I had to go back to high school for one last credit that I'd held off with for about two, three years uh, and gone to the work field. Um, My wife uh, at the time uh, had just had a son. She was a single mother. She was going back to high school as well. And we met at a place called the Lifetime Learning Center, basically an adult uh, high school. I only had to go there for the one semester. She'd been there for about a year and a half at this point. We met. We started hanging out a lot. She was initially trying to help me with a different girl. And then we ended up talking more. And then we ended up being the ones that uh, got together. And within a year, we were living together. Uh, it was her first place on her own. She was living with her family when we first met. Uh, I had already been out on my own uh, for quite a while since. Uh, I had been out on my own after I was kicked out when I was 16. Uh, I was homeless uh, for a little bit. Around that time, diagnosed uh, bipolar type 2. And then, go figure, uh, you know, fast forward all these years. Here, around April. My work uh, was returning to office post-COVID life. Uh, For someone like myself, this was extremely challenging on its own right. And it got to a point where I realized I needed therapy. Uh, And then I became self-aware of something called borderline personality disorder, BPD, which is a challenge, again, all in its own right. Especially when six months later, I go through probably one of the worst traumas of my life, suddenly losing my wife and now um, being left as a single dad uh, to my 15-year-old stepson and my seven-year-old daughter. Yeah, that's um, quite the journey that you took us on there. And sometimes I think it helps learning a diagnosis and learning you know, how to help manage some of those challenges, but then there also comes its own your own grief and acceptance of what that means for you for the future, whether it's therapy or medication or those types of things that you'll just have to manage going forward. Learning more about yourself can be helpful, but it also brings kind of a grief and additional challenge, I think, in its own right as well. Um, How was your wife understanding of some of those challenges, you know, initially as you, you guys were married and what was your relationship like? I mean, it was fairly good overall. Obviously, like any couple, we had our challenges uh, from time to time. You know, when I was much younger, I would have uh, considered myself more of a, you know, hopeless romantic type. 
whereas she was very much the opposite. Uh, but somehow we really, we really balanced each other out. And whether it be on the emotional side or even just the stuff around the house, you know, she took care of certain things. I took care of certain things. You know, I dealt with certain issues. She dealt with certain issues. And we balanced each other out and complimented each other quite nicely because of that. Yeah, that makes such a great partnership, I think. And maybe that's why opposites attract because you can kind of balance out the other person and pick up, you know, on their weaknesses where maybe it's an area that you're strong in. So for those of you who are not watching on video, I haven't asked Aaron his age, but he is young. I would say he's a young widower and uh, he has, you know, children that uh, obviously are young when he lost his wife five months ago. So do you mind to share um, with the audience uh, how old your kids are and what mm -hmm. that experience was like five months ago? As you shared with me, it was just completely unexpected. Yes. So uh, my stepson is 15. My daughter is seven. Uh, I myself am 37. And uh, my wife passed on her 35th birthday. Like I said, it was very sudden, you know, the day before, great mood. We're having good conversation. Um, normally, I would usually immediately just kind of get to cooking dinner and getting stuff up for winding down. But my wife was really excited. Uh, she had recently gone back into her arts and she's been attending craft shows and she was uh, asked to be a teacher uh, at a community center uh, around here um, for some of her fluid art and resin art. And uh, I decided to sit down with her while she showed me some of her new pieces. And then around three o'clock the next morning, I think it was, she woke up with a very bad headache. And within, you know, you know, I still went to work. We didn't think it was anything more than a flu. She was also prone to migraines. And uh, I went to work and I got the call. Uh, she was rushed to the hospital. Uh, she had to be transferred to another one where they had a neurosurgeon on site where they didn't have one here. And sure enough, uh, shortly after I got to the hospital, I got the news that she had uh, passed. And uh, we had to tell the kids, uh, thank you to the people at uh, Hamilton General for having the child life specialist there. Um, it was one of the only few times my daughter has actually cried through this. Kids are surprisingly resilient uh, through situations like this. Um, which led to some more challenges though in the coming days ahead. Because of how she passed, she was a prime organ donor. And we thought we had a week left to be around her. Um, then we got the call on Mother's Day that some girl needed her heart. Uh, so we rushed the hospital. I had to have the talk with my daughter and I didn't have a child life specialist to help me out this time. Now it was just me and the kids uh, and my seven-year-old daughter was like, can't we just let that other person die so that we can have a few more days around mom? Oh, I don't wish that on anybody having to have that conversation, but you know, otherwise they've been pretty resilient through this whole thing. They even uh, ended up speaking at the funeral. Um, we didn't, nor would she have wanted, uh, you know, a priest or, you know, one of the just general speakers that you can hire through them. Uh, I ended up thinking I was just going to be doing the eulogy. And then I meant doing the whole service and having different guests come on. And originally my daughter was just going to write something and her second cousin was going to be the one that said it. And then she decided, no, 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 I want to, to a packed chapel, um, standing room only. and so brave. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely incredible of your daughter. And uh, I can't really even fathom how I would try to have that conversation of making a decision for your for your wife and for the heart that was needed for someone else. And then going through the next steps of hosting, you know, the, the funeral service and then the mixed emotions you must have felt seeing your daughter get up there and read right. something like that in front of an audience that she'd written. That's incredible. Oh yeah. <laughs> She's an amazing little girl. <laughs> I'll give her that. And to remain so positive. And again, today is five months since and still just brightness coming from her every day. 
Yeah, that's that's really incredible. And kids navigating grief with kids is really hard because they do grieve so differently and they don't tend to stay in grief. They come in and out of it, which makes it even more complicated. I think for us as parents, yes. like, <laughs> you know, how can you laugh and be joking around about something? And my kids really dove into more of the dark humor. So, uh, you know, it was interesting even seeing how they grieve differently and how they handled it even compared to uh, a typical adult so I know exactly. that comes challenges of its own after your wife passed what was the support like for you did you have a lot of friends and family that swooped in to help you or what did that look like Absolutely. And that was in and of itself its own shock to the system and probably helped me get through that first month uh, a little bit easier. Um, so for those who don't know much about uh, that BPD thing I mentioned earlier, uh, something we typically uh, deal with is thinking that, you know, everybody hates us or, you know, we're fearful of abandonment uh, and things of that nature. And within a week uh, or less of her passing, I already had people outpouring, especially from my work. And thankfully, uh, my work has its own policy. Uh, four weeks paid off um, after that happened. And they've been very uh, understanding with things since. Uh, but anyways, uh, what I was getting at was next thing you know, I have a coworker of mine started a GoFundMe. And... Within a couple of weeks, the amount was huge and then the kind messages. And for someone who th normally goes through life thinking everyone does or is going to hate them or abandon them, to have everyone come forward like that was it was the, the worst and I don't want to say best uh, time, obviously, but a a, an awakening time for sure. Yeah, that really had to touch you at your core mm. to see the way I mean first of all kudos to your employer for giving four weeks paid off I hardly ever hear or see that I think most people might get a couple of days so that was mm -hmm. amazing and then how people came in they started the GoFundMe and probably shared a lot of sentiments with you of they wanted to help and they were going to be there to support you. And so that must have been almost a very surreal moment of, well, I thought everybody was going to forget about me. And then I have yeah. all this support now. Yeah, exactly. So we don't often hear, although I just talked to someone yesterday that also is a father of young children and a widower, but it's, I think it much more common for women are kind of dominating the widow space, unfortunately. Um, so, but I'm always curious, you know, for men and fathers of young children who have lost their wife, if you feel like you've had any unique challenges or experiences or struggles that maybe, you know, as women, I don't, we maybe take for granted that we can take our kids to the park and sit there and watch them and nobody gives us a side eye or whatever it is. There's always going to be a changing table in the bathroom, that kind of thing. Um, but have you felt like there's been any unique challenges or things that you've experienced as, as a father and widower? Oh, definitely. Um, now I know the topic, uh, I actually watched one of your videos on this earlier that came up very early on. And I think maybe the BPD comes into play here, but also I think the term is widow's fire. Um, you know, about a month, month and a half in, you know, I was still very much mourning and grieving my wife. And at the same time, I just felt so lonely. Now, I am generally more of a shy type on that area of my life. So, you know, it's not like I was going to clubs or anything like that, especially not at my age. But I decided to dip a toe in and, you know, signed up for dating apps. Uh, you know, your Tinders, your Bumbles, your Facebook datings, uh, things of that nature. And it did not take long for especially even some of the people who were supportive uh, in the beginning mainly usually friends of hers um who were very judgmental uh, of that aspect interestingly enough a common thing that came up was well what would the kids think do you think i'm telling my kids that i've signed up for dating apps or that I'm sharing that part of my life with them? Uh, absolutely not. That part of it made zero sense to me when they would come at me with things like that. 
I will definitely say, you know, there's times I wanted to dive right in to that life. And then the other times where I pulled uh, back away and like, no, no, I'm definitely not ready yet. But that definitely has not stopped uh, from certain people making their little uh, comments. Uh, on that same note, another uh, kind of a challenge I've dealt with, this one's been a little bit more recently. Um, you know, you talk about firsts, and I think one of the kind of major firsts that came up was back to school. Not even real holiday, uh, but that time of year. And my stepson's 15 now. You know, he he doesn't want to stand there for a back to school picture. Uh, before going out and catching uh, the bus. Not to mention, you know, I'm doing the morning routine by myself now, uh, and I had to get my little girl ready. And, you know, she's got to get her hair done and um, things like that. And we had the new outfit we got for her. Um, so I got a chance to have a picture with her, did not with him. And next thing you know, people are making their subtle little comments or sending me private messages of, oh, you know, where was his picture? Or... Uh, there was a big festival in our area. Uh, the Niagara area is very much known for, you know, grapes and wine. We have this big grape and wine festival. Now, he had uh, a birthday that he had planned with a friend of his for, like, the previous month and a half. Um, so rather than just my daughter and I hanging around the house, we went to the parade, we went to the festival, took pictures and posted them. And, you know, then I'm getting other subtle messages on there, like, Oh, I, I mean, I hope uh, Adrian got to join it, or, or sorry, my stepson got to join in, you know, and do you think I'm just leaving him at the house, like locked in his bedroom? No, uh, if he wanted to, and I have invited him out for things like this, but he's a 15-year-old boy, he wants to go hang out with his friends, uh, or, you know, the new girlfriend he's got now, uh, things of that nature, and if that's what's helping him get through this, I'm not going to force him, but yeah, again... People who have no idea what it's like to go through this, you know, pointing their fingers and making the little comments. It's, well, like I said, that issue earlier, you know, you assume everyone hates you, then I'm proven wrong, and then I'm starting proven right again. It's like, <laughs> well, there's no winning here. There's just no winning. <laughs> no, and I always think about, you know, if you had 10 friends and family members just standing in front of you, they're going to have 10 different opinions about how you need to handle things. And mm -hmm. I always find it so interesting that some of the most opinionated and sometimes judgmental people are the ones who've never gone through that. And it's hard because mm -hmm. before I was a widow, I'm sure I would have had thoughts and opinions about it too. Like, well, that may be weird or I could never imagine signing up for a dating app just a couple of months after my spouse died, but it's what I did. So, yep. you know, absolutely. But, absolutely. Yeah. But I think part of it too is because so many people don't understand grief is about, and it's not about either, or it's not like, Oh, I'm grieving or I'm not. It's this big complicated experience that we have. And uh, you know, you and I, neither one had dated for a long time after we got married. So it's like, what are these dating apps all about? And what kind of people are going to be on there? And what kind of trauma have they had? And, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of it's just curiosity in the beginning. So, um, yeah, oh, it, think... it's it's frightening out there. I got to say that new swipe left and right world. I mean, that was around 15 years ago, 14 years ago. And there's some interesting characters. Uh, I mean, there's this one person who I uh, saw the profile and thought maybe, you know, they were posting Halloween pictures because it's a couple months away. No, turns out they actually thought that they were pi a pirate. No. And uh, I'm like, hi, how are you today? And they're like, ahoy, I'm all righty or something like that. I'm like, Please tell me oh, there's a, more than a few red flags on your ship. Um, so then I learned what ghosting is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That could be a whole nother podcast series in itself. Just dating, <laughs> dating oh, again absolutely. and figuring out the apps and all that. That's just crazy. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's just very natural for people to feel opinionated. And I think sometimes people also feel like they need to worry about you like, Oh, mm -hmm. this person's doing something that's too soon, or that's going to hurt them. Or I think I know better or best. And 
it could be well-meaning even, but people just really are not educated about how to help somebody along on this journey. Absolutely. And kind of another point I almost forgot about till uh, just now when you were talking was, and this maybe is different for widows versus widowers, and that's many people do not want to come near in that way uh, a young male widower. Because again, you know, those preconceptions uh, usually uh, being a big part of it. And I noticed it when I was talking to uh, one girl. It was interestingly enough, someone who I knew around the same time that I met my wife. They were another student at that school uh, I mentioned before. And, you know, we're, she didn't know what happened. We we're just having a casual conversation uh, in the beginning. And then she asked the question So, whatever ended up happening? To your wife she thought we just maybe separated or something like that and then i let her know um unfortunately she passed a few months ago and then you could see the mood change right away and you know that kind of stereotypical person that you you know speak to when you're going through this they gave you the same platitudes the same comments it was like this great conversation i was having this person was morphing into another one of them. And then that led me to start thinking, you know what, I've been very honest on those dating app profiles about being a widowed single dad. And I decided to kind of test a theory where I edited my profiles and I took the widowed part out just to see if there would be a change um, in behaviors, numbers, what have you. And I'm afraid to say uh, there was. Uh, a major change. And of course, that being said, I, I'm not the type to keep things secret. Uh, oversharing is more my issue. Um, and so I would always let them know very early on in the conversation. And then sure enough, that's when they would fade away uh, at that point. And then at which point I updated all the profiles again to show widowed against like, all right, social experiment done. Um, back to honesty right out the gate. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, actually did something similar, but almost opposite. So I had widowed on my profile and I felt like I was getting a lot more scammer type people, a lot more people who thought they might be able to take advantage. Maybe you're like this sad little person. And I felt in the initial conversations with people that would always be like this big hurdle. So I ended up taking it off and I wouldn't make it a big deal. You know, if somebody was like, hey, so why are you on here? What are you looking for? I would just tell it as part of my story, but I didn't linger there. You know, I would say, but, you know, now for me, it's been over two years. I'm in a really good place. I'm excited about the future again, you know, really lean into that a little bit more. And I found that people then were like, oh, okay, I didn't make it a big deal. I felt yeah. like they weren't making it a big deal. But yeah, when people see that on your profile, I think it definitely causes concern. And I think it takes a special person to date somebody who's widowed. I think I have even considered that. And I feel like it could be intimidating, even though mm -hmm. I understand and I get it. It's still a tricky uh, situation to navigate, and it takes someone who's extremely understanding, I think. Absolutely. Uh, that point when I started realizing that, I was like, you know what? And some people even try to tell me, like, you don't expect to get anything real right out of the gate. Just go for simple, quick, short-term fun. And I'm just like, you know what? After 14 years uh, with someone, that's a really hard life to want to try to go back to once you've had real you don't want quick and easy I guess yeah yeah and I, I think some of it too is you know curiosity some of it is wanting to have someone to go do stuff with like I went mm -hmm. to lots of places on my own concerts uh, events just things first of all to get comfortable being by myself and those types of things but then also, you have that feeling of, oh, it'd be really nice if I had someone to consistently go with to say, hey, let's go to this movie or let's go to this event or whatever it is. So um, it's definitely understandable, I think, why we look for that, you know, companionship. Um, 
how has it been with your kids now as they're getting back into school and they're getting into somewhat of a new routine? Do you feel like they're getting their feet underneath them in a way, or has there been additional challenges there? I mean, most of the challenges in that regard have probably more so been on my end adjusting. Again, they have been so resilient uh, and strong. I think my stepson's biggest hurdle with the initial back to school was having to get up at an early hour again instead of you know getting up at 10 30 and playing games for the rest of the, <laughs> the rest of the day um so there's some mood issues there definitely within the first week there's been other events that have taken place since then as well uh, and somehow they've still managed to go through the night you know a couple friends of mine came over for dinner um my they leave we all had a good night and then we find out that their bunny that their mom bought them a few years earlier had just passed in the next room. Um, then you fast forward to about two and a half weeks ago. Um, now, me and him were not close. Let me just preface that right out the gate. Um, but two weeks ago, my father died. Um, we hadn't spoken in about 15 years, but I still felt the need to kind of let them know, like, hey, listen, you know, obviously, you know why you never met this particular grandfather but he did pass it was a little bit scary though with my daughter uh, in the beginning of telling her that because she initially was starting to get like teary-eyed to a point but i reminded her no that's don't forget you never met him he was not a good man and she's like oh right yep and goes back to her <laughs> back to her day like it was nothing like you flip that on and off a little bit uh too quickly um we're obviously trying to navigate, uh, you know, me being the sole uh, kind of leader in the house, I guess, uh, and all trying to work together. Overall, though, they've been pretty good at that. Everyone kind of knows that they have to step up a little bit, especially my stepson. Uh, I can't manage a full house on my own to some extent. I'm not having him work. Uh, I want to make sure he keeps offering to go get a job. And I'm like, no, your job right now is school. Go do that. Um. But, I mean, he's just started dating himself now. And then you got my little girl uh, who's, you know, becoming more sociable and having her own social life with friends. And I tell you, I try to raise a little girl without uh, being one yourself and having one to lean on. I mean, already I've had challenges of, like, how do I manage hair? I mean... <laughs> Uh, I was very, very lost uh, in the beginning there. And because they were still in school when everything first happened, they themselves were only off for about two and a half weeks. Uh, what does she come back with um, after the first couple of days? Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Um, I had a major freak out over that one. <laughs> $150 later, and I got sick of cleaned those bed sheets and I just went out and bought new ones. They were Disney princesses. There was no complaints, but even just, you know, keeping hair straight uh, and, you know, when should we cut it? I very much lean on the fact that thankfully I have more female friends than male friends to be able to ask when it comes to that, you know, you can't always go to them and sometimes you're left with, how do I do this? Yeah. Yeah, and it might be good for her if one of your friends or a friend of the family could help kind of step in and, you know, just occasionally spend some one-on-one -on -one girl time together um, and just maybe be kind of that big sister or aunt uh, type of role yeah. model for her. Um, I know there have been a couple of men that I know that have stepped in at times to just help with, I have three boys yeah. and then, then a girl. <laughs> and it's hard because even though I know we're in a hot, you know, gender role topic culturally, I think there are difference, differences between a mom and a dad and having those roles and those figures in your, your children's life is helpful and important, but it's hard when you want to be able to be both of those, but at the same time, you know, that's not really your strength or your wheelhouse and she they still need that that person in their life even as just as a mentor exactly exactly and i've had a couple especially good friends uh that have been for me for that uh and for her um 
but I know people's lives get busy, but this goes back to that BPD and also it's still grieving. And then next thing you know, it's like, oh, I haven't heard them from in a while. You know, are they still there? And then sure enough, I get proven wrong down the road eventually, but it can be challenging uh, in the meantime. But at the end of the day, uh, I know that they will always be there for my daughter if I need them uh, to be. So that's, oh yeah, it definitely helps. Oh, that's great. Well, five months out, uh, it's incredible that you're sitting here being willing to share your story and to talk about, you know, some of the challenges and things that you've been through. What what would you tell um, other, you know, young widows and widowers who are just really still struggling and reeling um, and certainly probably someday still feel like you're in survival mode? Uh, what words of encouragement or advice would you give them? Early on, uh, when it's just happened, I would say, you know what, in a weird way, I wouldn't say enjoy this time, but take advantage of the shock because you don't feel it all in that first moment. Use that time if you can um, to get stuff done pack things away or, you know, maybe move things around if you need to. Um, because in another month or two after, you're probably not going to have the motivation to do it then. I'm not going to lie and say it gets better. It just changes and evolves. And it's not linear. It's up and down. Uh, the day after it happened, my uncle who not quite as young and didn't have the kid aspect because uh, they were growing and moved out. Um, but his wife had passed uh, about 12 years back. And he told me in the beginning, this isn't something you get over. It's something you get through. Um, and I would say that to anybody who's going through this uh, same experience uh, right now as well. And don't let other people tell you how you should grieve. Only you will know how you can grieve while going through it. Like you said earlier, you know, you wouldn't think you do certain things when you're just casually talking about it with your partner uh, leading up to a moment like this. Uh, but after it's happened, you learn a lot more about yourself, uh, but you can't expect that that's going to be the way it works for everybody. Yeah. And, and I totally agree. And people are going to have all kinds of different opinions. So don't get so caught up in what yeah. everybody else thinks, especially if they've not gone through anything near a similar experience. So um, being two years. Even uh, similar. Yeah. Go sorry. Ahead. Even similar experiences, even because I did feel the need, like I got to talk to people who get this to some extent. And I found a Facebook group for other widows and widowers, but it was a more general group. Uh, and people my age may not necessarily have the same challenges as someone in their 60s, 70s, or 80s. And, you know, when I tried to share certain things that I was thinking about, such as some of the topics we've already discussed today, you know, a lot of people did not get very supportive in those groups. Luckily, I ended up finding another one, and this is some maybe another piece of advice, you know, find the right group that fits for you and i found one for extremely uh young and widowed um only accepting uh people in their 20s and 30s and i will say i was able to relate a lot more even the cause of death a lot more common uh in that group yeah i think there's definitely unique challenges that young widows and widowers have and especially if you have kids at home or you have someone you're taking care of and at that age, you're grieving the future just as much as you are the past where someone in their seventies or eighties, they're grieving a lot of the past and those things. And we're still trying to figure out, well, what is the rest of the story here? What is my future going to look like? You know, I haven't mm -hmm. even got to thinking about grandkids and all that other, that other stuff yet. So it's just a unique, different set of challenges that I think is really helpful to hear from people like you and hear from other people that are in a similar situation so that people know they're not alone and that if if you can be resilient and you can get through this, then they can too. Exactly. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing your story. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me again. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to the Brave Widow Podcast. 
I would love to help you take your next step, whether that's healing your heart, finding hope, or achieving your dreams for the future. Do you need a safe space to connect with other like-minded widows? Do you wish you had how-tos for getting through the next steps in your journey, organizing your life, or moving through grief? What about live calls where you get answers to your burning questions? The Brave Widow membership community is just what you need. Inside, you'll find courses to help guide you, a community of other widows to connect with, live coaching and Q&A calls, and small group coaching where you can work on what matters most to you. Learn how to heal your heart, find hope, reclaim joy, and dream again for the future. It is possible. Head on over to bravewidow.com to learn more.